So hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about this is actually this talk is actually based on a semester project I did with uh, Professor uh, Michel Struber last semester about the Navier-Stokes equations. And basically, uh, what I did in this semester project, I followed uh, uh, the third part of his course on uh, nonlinear evolution equations. And in there, there were quite a few of uh, uh, details left to be filled in. So basically, what I did in the semester project is go through the papers in detail and uh, look up the papers. And that's basically what I will be talking about today. So uh, perhaps many of you have heard the Navier-Stokes about the Navier-Stokes equation. This is uh, what I'll be talking about. So first, I will introduce uh, what the Navier-Stokes equation is. Uh, existence and smoothness problem, which is uh, one of the Millennium Prize problems. Uh, I'll talk about the existence of our weak solutions in that dimensions, in, in all dimensions, in fact, a bit about the regularity, um, the uniqueness of the solutions. And I hope that I will be able to get at least uh, talk and about this interior, interior regularity theorem. This is my favorite theorem. And if I have time, I'll talk about the last two. Okay, so you can see my cursor on the screen, what I'm pointing at, right? Um, cool. So, um, yeah, why are we interested? What is the Navier-Stokes equation even? So let me get out the pen. Okay, so perhaps you, uh, if any of you have been here since the start of the semester, you might have uh, remembered that we talk about conservation laws. So um given a uh, space can you see me drawing oh, yeah so you have a space yes i can in... yep great so if you have uh, some region in rn and you have a vector field let's call this u so u is a vector field and split it and what u does is transport some quantity say let's call this ff can be, could be temperature could be pressure, could be uh, any fast physical quantity you're trying to measure. And and how do we measure the, the and the, the rate of change of F can be expressed in, the, in, in terms of how much of this F is flowing out, is being carried out by this vector field U um, plus uh, source term, how much of this F is being generated in this region. And so we have this conservation law, which holds, uh, which is very general. And then when we let this uh, particular f be a velocity, be u itself, we have the Euler equations, which was uh, alluded to in the second talk. And over here, the generator of velocity is like the, is the gradient of the pressure, is the force. So this Euler equation models the flow of uh, inviscid fluids, fluids which have no viscosity. Talk about by Maximilian. Um, but in real situations, we want to uh, study fluids with viscosity. So what does viscosity mean? So if, let me get out the, 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 the pen again. Um, so what, what do we mean by viscous? So if uh, in a pipe, if we have in the center, we have, uh, we have fluid flowing very fast and at the sides, the fluids are flowing pretty slowly then what tends to happen over time is that this fast moving liquid speeds up the slower moving liquid and uh, vice versa. So there's uh, some sort of diffusion going on. This is what a viscosity does to a fluid. It averages out the surrounding velocities and that's how we get this uh, diffusion term in the Navier-Stokes equation. So this over here, what I have here is the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, some special cases that uh, physicists and engineers like to consider is uh, the case for very small velocities. Uh, so for very small ve velocities, so this nonlinear term can be ignored in a very rough sense. And when we ignore this nonlinear term, we get a parabolic a heat equation. So this has very nice properties and this very smooth and regular properties of the heat equation uh, presents itself in nature as uh, laminar flow flow which we can, no turbulence flow which we can understand pretty well. And on the other hand, when, when uh, the velocities are really large, then 
the diffusion term can be ignored and we get, so we ignore this term, we get Euler equation. And this is when, when U is large, this is when we start to see turbulent effects happening in the fluid. So both regimes are fiscally interesting. Well, we're interested in both of them. And okay, now I have to erase what I've drawn here. Okay, so uh, this is the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so maybe you recall from the from Maximilian's talk that in uh, three spatial dimensions, we given an initial smooth initial data of the Euler equations. We actually still do not know if we have global smoothness, whether the the solutions remain smooth for infinite time. So. One, one may think that if you add the diffusion term because it becomes a pep, it becomes you add up some the Laplacian you may think that okay maybe the problem becomes uh, a bit better we understand a bit more but unfortunately this is not the case and in fact it's still an open problem to determine where the smooth solutions of the Navier-Stokes uh, give rise to uh, can be extended to smooth global solutions so very roughly speaking. Um, this is uh, one of the Millennium Prize problems. That is to say, given the Navier-Stokes equations with smooth initial data, does that um, can we always find a global smooth solution? And over here, the second condition refers to a divergence. We are only, to be precise, we are looking at an incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, and so we require the divergence of the velocity field to be zero. And this uh, Millennium Prize problem is uh, is. Uh, made very precise by Charles Pfefferman, but I don't think the details are important for us today. Roughly speaking, roughly this is what, it, this is the main question we're trying to answer. And so, okay, let us ignore the smoothness for the time being, and let's consider general solutions first. So what do we mean by a solution? So the, 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 the upshot is that the thing is, if we are too stubborn, if we are too restrictive and we keep insisting on smooth solutions, we may not be able to find any solution. So perhaps it makes sense to um, broaden our view and uh, consider more general kinds of solution. After all, in lots of physical examples, for example, like the breaking of the dam, this, this like impulsive uh, nature, nature of, of this uh, break, dam breaking phenomenon, it, you you, ex, you expect the, the you don't expect the solutions to be smooth because there's a sudden change in the environment. So, on the other hand, if we are not restrictive enough on what we consider a solution, we lose the uniqueness, and this is not good either. So, um, in the study of partial differential equations, we the the there's a subtlety. We really want to uh, find exactly the right notion of solution so that we can have both uniqueness and uh, uniqueness and uh, existence. So um, throughout this talk, we'll see a few examples of these conditions on, on uh, the, the restrictions of what we consider to be a solution and what, uh, what not. And now I will go into the mathematical content proper. So, um, for this talk, I will be focusing on the domain, uh, the uh, TN. TN is the torus of n dimensions. The, this torus is actually not very physical because it implies periodic solutions, and and this doesn't really translate into physics. But uh, many of the tech, but the advantage of working with TN is that unlike a uh, uh, bounded domain in Rn, we can ignore boundary conditions. It's compact and we can ignore boundary conditions. So it's a mathematically simpler case. So uh, equation three, you can see the Navier-Stokes. Equation four says that the fluid is incompressible and equation five say is the initial condition. So let us first assume that we have a twice differentiable function u. And we can integrate it. We can, we can just multiply equation three by u and get the following energy equality. So you can imagine, okay, I multiply this term by u, uh, then this u goes into the into u square and this u square manifests itself here. Uh, multiplied by u here, bring the 
gradient onto the other side, it comes here, multiplied by u here, uh, these two terms disappear, we, we get this energy equality. It's completely elementary. Um, yeah, why we do this, uh, and you can, why, why is it called the energy inequality? You can roughly think about it as uh, this way. So this is something like the initial kinetic energy. This is a uh, kinetic energy at time t, and this term uh, involves like the dissipation of the energy through this uh, viscous friction effect. Uh, okay, multiplying by u and integrating by parts seem like a pretty random thing to do, but we'll see later that uh, this plays a very important role in exist uh, in the uniqueness theory. So let's just remember this en energy equality for now, and uh, yeah, let's keep it in the fridge for now and move on. So we want to extend our notion of solution. So we say that we can define what we call a weak solution. So if we um, if we multiply equations three and four by 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 u, no, by by a smooth compact compactly supported function, we will get this condition: uh, integrate by parts. So. Okay, so we say that u is a weak solution if this integral equation holds. And what kind of uh, u's are we looking at? So now this uh, looks a bit intimidating at first, but let me explain. So the u's we are interested in will be u's living in this function space. Um, Okay, this basically means that the gradient of u is L2 in space and time. And this means that the L2 norm is uh, bounded uniformly in time. So why are we interested in function, this function space? This like, looks like a pretty random thing to look at because when we look at u's in this function space, we can always prove existence. We can always find a u to an initial value problem into which u lies in this weirdly defined function space. So, the guarantee of existence is what motivates this. So in 1951, uh, Hopf proved the following theorem. For the initial value problem for u naught in uh, L2, we can always find a weak solution that is this thing, uh, the solution to this thing, to which u lies in this function space. And that the energy uh, big uh, no, bolt here, energy inequality is satisfied, so in general, the energy equality is not satisfied because integration by part doesn't hold, but we still can get the, we can weaken it to an inequality. So by the way, this hop is not the Heinz hop, you know, from topology is Everard hop, another hop. Uh, and now I'll give a, a quite a, a proof of the following theorem, a sketch of the proof rather, because I think the idea is uh, quite intuitive. So how 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 does uh, how did Hop prove the existence of weak solutions? Idea is rather simple. So what we what what he did was to consider this uh, family of functions phi i, this uh, L two orthonormal basis of divergence free eigenfunction. So what this basically means is. A uh, complete set of eigenfunctions, like imagine Fourier, Fourier series from MMP. These are complete sets of uh, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So for arbitrary for the, for arbitrary compact domain, we can also find a similar L2 orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions. And then what what he did was basically uh, construct a Galikian approximation, uh, use is something like Fourier series, and then prove that this Fourier series converges. So. Um, yeah, we add some, we, we construct an approximate solution by, uh, we denote this by ui, is the i-th Gallican approximation. So we add some co time dependent coefficients to the uh, eigenfunctions, which is like your Fourier series. And then um, how do we determine alpha i? We throw it into the weak form of the, of the Navier Stokes uh, equation. We just throw this into this equation. We declare that, okay, this condition must be satisfied. And now the problem suddenly becomes more tractable because this is actually a finite dimensional problem. You can actually explicitly solve for the coefficients. Um, so for the i degree approximation, we actually 
the coefficients of alpha i actually drop out. We get a couple nonlinear OD system, and this and this happens to be uh, globally solvable in time. So we get this uh, i approximate solution. And then after that, we um, we can show that this ui converges in some sense to uh, some candidate solution. And then we just check that this uh, solute, that this indeed solves the Navier-Stokes equation weakly. And because we are considering weak convergence, this is actually where the where we lose the energy equality. So you see here on the actual solution, when we pass to the limit, we don't get equality of limits. We the bit that are weak, the lower semi-continuity of the, the norm. Uh, we actually have to weaken this to a limb in, but this UI, these approximate solutions are smooth. So the energy equality holds, and this is just, this step to this step is just a Planchel's theorem for Fourier series. So the conclusion is that these solutions that Hopf proved to exist actually satisfy the energy inequality. And this kind of functional analytic, uh, if any of you have studied PDEs, so this kind of functional analytic um, approach to proving existence where you uh, have some series of approximate solutions and then you use some compactness to construct uh, an actual solution. This technique is may seem very common nowadays, but uh, in the 1950s, I think Hopf was, I read that Hopf was actually one of the first people who use this technique. So this technique is actually quite novel in its time. And today we use it like it's free. All right, so now we have existence. Uh, and now I'm from this existence of solutions in this abstract function space, can we hope for anything better? Can we actually prove that these functions are differentiable? Are they smooth? I'm going to talk a bit about that this uh, talk a bit about that now. Uh, for that, um, for those of you who haven't really taken a course in PDs, uh, there'll be a slight digression. So consider this. So if we want, uh, I'm going to introduce something called a bootstrap argument. There's actually um, a form of induction. So suppose that we want to prove that the solutions to this equation, d dy dx equals to y is smooth. Um, what do we do? I mean, okay, all of us know that a solution is the exponential function. And so this is, we obviously, and the exponential function is smooth. So um, doesn't really it may seem pretty stupid, but let's say we didn't know that. So we can integrate both sides and we get this. Um, and now the, the thing is if the Y has N derivatives, it has also has n plus one derivatives. So using this kind of inductive uh, argument, we can prove that y is smooth. And in the context for the Navier-Stokes equation, we will actually be considering um, uh, equations of this form, like the Poisson equation. And very classical results tell us that, uh, like shorter estimates, if the right-hand side is uh, n times differentiable, the, the left-hand side is n plus two times differentiable, and something similar holds for uh, Sobolev spaces. So how does that, how, how are we going to use this technique to uh, show that solutions are smooth in uh, n equals to two? So for n equals to two, um, and in the previous theorem, we require the initial conditions to be only L2, but now if we assume it to be H1, H1 basically means the derivatives are in L2 as well. So H1 is even stronger than L2. So any of the weak solutions are constructed by Hopf, this following estimate holds. So the L2, the gradient, the L2 norm, the gradient is uniformly bounded. Um, how does this imply smoothness? So you can rewrite the Navier-Stokes equation in the following form. And because we know that um, u, uh, number u is in L2, 
and and u is in l in, uh, is in lq for all q less than infinity by Sobolev embedding theorem um, the product lies in this space within l1 yeah lq for q between one and two and then using the Cauron Zygmunt estimate we can prove that the u's on this side have um, two spatial derivatives and one temporal derivative and then we just repeat this argument we throw this um, u with more derivatives onto the right hand side and then we get n plus four derivative n plus uh, three spatial derivatives and n plus two temporal derivatives and so on so it really does and, and therefore we prove that uh, u is smooth and this the fact that u is smooth really crucially relies on this estimate over here Okay, this is basically what I said. Maybe I should have shown this point first. Okay, so um, in two spatial dimensions, the existence problem, uh, the smoothness problem is completely solved. All solutions are smooth. What about uh, n equals to three? So in n equals to three, unfortunately, we cannot have such a uniform estimate. Uh, even if we assume that u naught is in H1, uh, this we only have this following estimate and you see that the time appears in the denominator so as the time approaches this t naught this bound blows up so for by the same arguments as the previous slide we can actually show that uh, u is smooth for this finite amount of time before the blow up time but anything beyond this time we can't say anything um, however um, with some more work, we can actually uh, derive this uh, corollary. It doesn't follow, it's not obvious from the above theorem, but if we assume the initial data to be particularly small and the derivatives to be way, way smaller than the L2 norm of the initial data, we can actually prove global smoothness in n equals to three. And this actually does not solve the Navier Stokes existence and smoothness problem in n equals to three because, in general, recall we we are looking for smooth initial data and smooth initial data the derivatives are not necessarily small so what it says over here is that um, either you prove smooth you either have smoothness for a short uh, limited amount of time or you have smoothness if your data initial data is sufficiently regular but smooth solutions in general do not have to have small derivatives so problem not solved Um, okay, now the next question, apart from uh, uniqueness, uh, existence is uniqueness. What can we say about uniqueness? So uh, before going on further, I need to introduce the following function space. So this uh, makes uh, L S S prime function space with this is just the, the S refers to the integrability in the spatial coordinates and S prime to the temporal coordinates. Uh, and we require that S and S prime satisfy this uh, condition, those strange condition, but technically necessary. And then uh, there's a lemma, uh, which I uh, verified uh, in my semester project, that if U uh, is in this function space, so not just in that uh, V10 function space we defined, but also have satisfied this integrability condition, then the energy equality is satisfied. So now one may one one may ask, um, okay, so certainly if your if your solutions are smooth, um, then it's certainly integrable. So um, classical solutions always satisfy the integrability condition, and uh, recall that previously uh, in the Hopf existence theorem we only had an energy inequality. So one may ask that one may ask themselves if could we perhaps use this lemma to prove that the energy equality holds and unfortunately not because you see in a, for the Hopf solutions uh, the Hopf solutions uh, what are the exponents over here let's check so s is 2 and s prime is infinity so s prime is infinity so this term is 0 and in n equals to 2 uh, S equals to two, N equals to two, and then we hit the corner case. So uh, tough luck. So 
energy equality can't be proven for the for hop solutions and indeed there are counter examples okay why is this energy equality important so we'll see in the next slide so uh serene in uh, 1962 proved the following so suppose that u and v are both weak solutions any weak solutions not not hop weak solutions nothing just any weak solutions but they satisfy the following condition so v one of them satisfies the energy inequality and the other one satisfies the integrability condition mentioned in the uh, previous slide and if it satisfies the integrability condition then they satisfy e energy equality so if i have two such solutions then the following estimate holds and this is a estimate that implies uniqueness of solutions why because if the initial data is uh, the same then the right hand side is zero and then this implies that for all time um, the solutions remain identical in l2 norm so this statement really proves existence among solutions which satisfy the hypothesis of course how does one prove a statement like that one starts off with the energy inequality so take it out from the fridge we see in like the second or third slide this is where it plays a crucial part v satisfies the energy inequality the other one satisfies the energy equality and then we want to take the difference so we just uh, subtract them and we do some crazy algebraic manipulation and in this crazy uh, manipulation because we need to do integration by parts many times this integrability condition is really crucial it can't be done away without and so we prove the energy this uh, inequality and this is a ground wall type inequality from uh, ODEs uh, you recall if you have a inequality that looks something like this uh, then it's bounded by an exponential function so this statement over here implies this so this we have this uh, rather abstract result uh what does it or uh, what are some how how do we summarize it so this means that in n equals two because all solutions are smooth so they all solutions satisfy the hypothesis in the previous theorem so all solutions are smooth then all solutions are unique so in two spatial dimensions problem is completely solved for three and four spatial dimensions, we have something called weak, strong uniqueness. So what does that mean? So if we have a classical solution, that is one that satisfies the integrability condition, and then we have another weak solution, which only satisfies the energy inequality, then they must be the same. That's what the previous uh, theorem implies. However, this is weak, strong uniqueness. And you can see that this classical solution it serves as some sort of a mediator between all weak solutions because if we can't find a classical solution then the uniqueness may not hold so in in a n equals to three or more dimensions it's totally possible that there's no classical solution and the weak solutions are not unique because the hypothesis of the previous theorem simply doesn't hold so yeah it seems that in uh, spatial dimensions uh, not equal to two we uh, encounter lots of uh, loose ends open problems that uh, are yet to be solved so there are however some partial regularity results in uh, three spatial dimensions and i will present one of them now uh, this is actually my favorite uh, theorem my uh, my favorite paper in this whole project I'll, uh, I'll explain why later so you see for um serene what serene proved in 1962 was this so consider three spatial dimensions um let u be a uh, any weak solution in this v10 function space and if u is in addition in addition uh, also sufficiently integrable then what we can conclude is that u is uh, also smooth c infinity in the smooth variable so you see that uh, in the previous slide about the and uh, on the uniqueness this was really three over s plus two over s prime equals to one so you see this uh 
this type of inequality seems to uh, occur very often. Um, so now I'll just, I think the idea of the proof is very elementary, it's quite cute in fact, so that's why it's my favorite proof, I will briefly explain how one uh, obtains this result. So let's start off with, uh, by denoting omega by the curl of u, so in physics terms it's called the vorticity, it's how much the fluid spins around a certain point, and then from uh, that we have the following representation formula for u in terms of its curl. So what is this formula? So maybe you remember from, it re really reminiscent of uh, the Biot-Savart law from uh, electromagnetism. So recall if you have uh, the magnetic field, the curl of the magnetic field is equals to the current. And then how do you reverse this process? You can actually compute the magnetic, uh, you can actually, compute the current by integrating the magnetic field. So this is exactly the built Savart law from electromagnetism with symbols replaced by u and omega. Uh, on the other hand, we have another equation. So if we take the curl of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is just a computation, we get the following uh, PDE in, uh, for the vorticity. So now using equations eight and nine, we are going to apply this inductive bootstrap argument. So really there are two steps to the proof. Uh, first, we assume that U is in a LSS prime. Uh, from here, we will prove that omega is actually C zero alpha. So it's our holder continuous. And then once we get holder continuity, we can get uh, um, yeah, smoothness. So let us ignore the first part first. Let's assume, let's look at this, uh, this step, this second step just for illustrative purposes. So first we assume that uh, omega already, we have already proven that omega has n derivatives. And what do we do next? Look at equation eight. So it gives you n plus two derivatives, how come? So um, you see this one over x, this is like the Green's function for the Laplacian. So when I convolve this uh, omega with the Green's function of the Laplacian, I apply the Schauder estimate. So U has N plus, uh, N plus two derivatives. So I think this is a typo here because we take the gradient. So U has now N plus one derivative. So change this to one. Um, let me get out my pen. Yeah, okay, repeat. Um, Multi green function of Laplacian, you gain two derivatives, you take the gradient, uh, so you get n plus one. And then what do we do after that? Uh, I'll go to the next slide. Okay, and from here, you get um, the right-hand side of, so now you look at the right-hand side of the equation nine. So, uh, so you have uh, n derivatives multiplied by u, which is n minus one derivatives. So their product is restricted by n minus one. So this side has n minus one derivative. Let's ignore this gradient first. And then we use the Schauder estimate uh, to show that omega on the left-hand side, omega has n plus, um, n plus one derivative. And so omega now has yeah, n plus one derivative. I made a mistake somewhere here. Um, okay, I'll look back at this slide later if there's some mistake. I, I think I, I tracked the exponents wrongly, okay. Okay, but now we can go back here. So let's assume that omega has n plus one derivatives. And then we, we go back to apply eight by the same argument as before. Now u has n plus three derivatives, but we take the gradient. So now u has n plus two derivatives. So now you see that magically from um, this u having n plus one derivative, u suddenly gains what n gains one derivative just by inducting on both of these equations. And using this method, we, uh, we keep going on and u becomes smooth. So that's how we prove the second part. And the first part is actually really similar. 
because this is a heat equation. So we can explicitly write out the heat kernel and the proof proving the first part essentially involves uh, making some clever use of uh, Young's convolutional inequality and Holder's inequality, playing with the exponents such that um, using the aforementioned integrability condition, we can actually make S and S prime inductively grow larger and larger until it eventually hits uh, L infinity, infinity, and then we make the jump over to Holder continuity. So this is a summary of uh, the proof. Let me see how much time I have left. Uh, Silvio, do you end at 1.45 or 2? Um, between 1.45 and 2. Okay. So, yeah. So that's the partial regularity result of for n equals 3. We can't say that the solution is smooth, but if the solution satisfies this integrability condition, we can. And Let's see. Okay, so I'll just very briefly talk, 15 minutes, I'll just briefly talk about the other two results which I did in my semester paper. So now we look at the generalized, this uh, improvement of the, I could say is, uh, I think, one of the very famous results for regularity in three spatial dimensions. So, instead of the energy inequality, we call, instead of multiplying the Navier-Stokes equation by u, now we can multiply by u phi, and phi is compactly supported and smooth. We get the following localized form of the energy inequality. And uh, Kaffarelli, Cohen, and Nirenberg, what they basically did is consider solutions that satisfy this energy inequality. And for these solutions, they very creatively named them suitable weak solutions. Okay, so this name was a bit confusing to me at first. Like, is it, it was a suitable part of the name or is it just an adjective? But okay, the, the name stick, the name stuck, unfortunately. So yes, we, what, what's a suitable weak solution? If uh, UMP solves the Navier-Stokes equation, if it lies in the, in this function, V10 function space, if it, most important part is if it satisfies this uh, energy inequality and uh, important remark is that every suitable weak solution is also a weak solution which satisfies the energy general energy inequality because we can simply let phi to be the constant function one and then all these terms disappear only the first line remains we get uh, the energy uh, inequality uh, as uh, in the first few slides. So uh, what did Kaffrey Cohen Nuremberg prove? about these suitable weak solutions. They prove us. Uh, so, okay, I need to make this definition first. So in space time, we call a point regular if UXT is uh, essentially bounded in some neighborhood. So the singularity, so at that point, the solution does not blow up, does not go to infinity. We call it regular. If it's not regular, we call it singular. Uh, let QR denote a parabolic cylinder. So it's just like an open neighborhood around a point. And what they proved was uh, this. So if this uh, gradient is sufficiently small, then it is a regular point. So why is this called a blow up uh, result for the following reason? So let's say a point is singular, so it's not regular. Then the contrapositive says that this inequality is reverse. Um, what are the dimensions of these R? So you look at QR. This is actually this has dimensions of actually uh, three spatial dimensions. So um, R to the power of five, cancelled out by one over R. So R to the power of four. So if this inequality will be violated, it means that as R goes to zero, the gradient of U blows up faster than one over R squared. So what does this say? This says that if you have, if Navier-Stokes equation ever encounters singularity, the singularity must, the gradient must grow faster than one over R squared. Anything less is not possible. So this is uh, some kind of classification result, uh, which uh, was uh, important at that time because of the, the following corollary. 
So somehow having a um, the singular set of a suitable weak solution, this is the Hausdorff dimension. Uh, a corollary is that the Hausdorff dimension is zero, which means that the set of singular points uh, must be so must be somewhat less than a line. It must be quite scattered. So line has Hausdorff dimension one, a plane has Hausdorff dimension two, and so on. The proof of this is actually very short, so much so that when my, so much so that I can actually fit the entire proof of this corollary in one page, but I won't go into the details. The idea is that because we had a bound on the gradient, because for uh, suitable weak solutions, we have a bound on the gradient. And on the other hand, for singular points, we have a lower bound on the how fast the gradient must blow up. This means that if, the, if there are too many singular points, then the L2 norm of the gradient will be infinity. And that's not that's a contradiction. So using this contradiction and a covering covering lemma of the singular set, we can prove the we can give a bound for the Hausdorff dimension. So this is all I'll say for this your, uh, result. And the I guess I'll I'll, I'll briefly talk if I haven't lost you yet, I I'll briefly talk about um, what I, the, the final result I covered my semester uh, project. So you may think, how do the previous results I mentioned, how do they even, how do they all link up together? So it all comes together in this paper. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation, I repeat. So, and this is, uh, you, we can actually make the following observation that if u p is a solution, then by the scaling properties of this equation, this uh, multiplied by r, this uh, scaled version is also a solution. So this motivates us to consider uh, solutions of the following following form. But uh, uh, we, we make this manipulation so that uh, in the hope of finding some explicit solutions with Navier-Stokes equation, we reduce the dimension by one. So uh, Larry asked in his 1934 paper, uh, if it's possible to construct solutions which blow up of the following form. So this is basically the self-similar solution, but we artificially introduce a, a singularity in the denominator. So yeah, you can certainly consider uh, solutions of the following form and ask whether we can make these solutions blow up. like achieve a singularity. So this was a conjecture by Lurie. He didn't solve it. If you plug this equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, you get a following elliptic uh, PDE. And so for a really long time, uh, no one knew whether, whether what Lurie proposed was actually possible. And then in 1996, after like 50 or 60 years, uh, these three people uh, proved that actually it's not possible to have such blow up solutions. So this is a precise statement. So this is the Navier-Stokes equation for the self-similar solutions elliptic system. And they proved that, okay, uh, tough life. U, U, is U must be identically equal to zero. And how this was proven is first, uh, using the techniques in the first part of the talk, we boots, do the bootstrap argument to show that U is smooth. And then near the blow up time, this uh, T equals to T naught, this smallness condition required by the Caffarelli Cornierenberg blow up result holds. So with that, we can actually show that U, uh, this uh, capital U goes to zero as wide as uh, far away from the origin. And then after we've shown that ui uh, is, uh, vanishes at, at infinity, the maximum principle for elliptic equations, so this is just, like, just imagine the maximum principle for the Laplace equation, says that uh, the maximum, the extremal points of, uh, of the solution must always lie on the boundary, cannot lie on the interior. So this forces u to be identically equal to zero. So this is the main outline of the proof. And you can see here we use uh, techniques from the Caffarelli Corner Nuremberg paper, the Serene's regularity paper. So everything uh, mentioned in the, uh, the previous paper was somehow involved in this uh, rather monumental paper. 
uh, and yeah, this is the main, I'll say this is perhaps the main result which I uh, read in my semester paper and try to work out all the details. And uh, with that, that ends my talk. So here are the references. So if uh, I went too fast and you're interested, too interested, so this uh, project was heavily based, followed by uh, Professor Struve's notes on nonlinear evolution problems. You can find it here. And these are the papers I, uh, I read. So uh, I'm, I'm at the end. Are there any questions? No questions? Um, I have a question uh, yeah, about- Yeah, there is a question on the chat. Okay, so I see Dana. Uh, I mentioned that for a very small velocity of a smoothness result for dimensions three or more, can that be made more concrete so that for slow flow where this result is actually helpful or more like there exists an epsilon? Okay, so um, to be precise, the smoothness, small velocities, the smoothness results only holds for dimension three because the manipulations of the inequalities are very sensitive to dimension because the Sobolev inequalities are sensitive to dimension. So that result only holds for three, but I guess that's um, what interests are most uh, physicists or engineers. Are there practical examples of slow flow where this result is helpful? So I'm, okay, I'm not sure whether, whether these abstract smoothness results can actually be applied, but in physical applications in three dimensions, there are a lot of, there are quite a few explicit uh, examples of flows and they are all smooth. So for example, Stokes flow, or flow of Navier-Stokes solution around a sphere. There's a very explicit solution to this. So this is certainly smooth. Um, good, um, did I answer your, so, so there, are, there are explicit, there are certainly explicit solutions. Uh, and these solutions are, are smooth. So does that answer? Yeah, okay. Uh, and Toscan asks, uh, I have a question about equation nine. So what is equation nine? Let me see. Oops, uh, I did something bad. So maybe I screen share again. Okay, can see my slides. Um, window view, full screen. Okay, what's equation nine? Okay, uh, yeah, what, what's, what, what's your question about equation nine? I, I need to look, open the chat. I can read that for you. Uh, he asked, why can we use some sort of parabolic regulation there? What, what do you mean by we can't? I, I, I didn't mention the, you know, could you be more specific maybe? I mean, I, I didn't mention parabolic. I didn't say we can't, did, did I? It's like a teaser for a more direct argument for the proof. More direct argument. So I, I guess, I guess, I guess um, to my knowledge, like I'm, I'm not very sure what you mean, but for regularization procedures. Okay, so I think important, this is actually a nonlinear equation. These are both terms in U, so I'm not sure how you will implement that I think you may, maybe you could, but I think it'd be tricky because this is nonlinear. So, yeah. I mean, usually the arguments I saw for like convolve against a mollifying kernel, yeah, I'll usually see it for linear equations. So, Okay, any more questions?
No, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Okay, yeah. so Toscan has a clarification. Um, he said, uh, he um, uh, can you read it? Yeah, uh, parabolic okay. equation smoothen. They smoothen, yes, they smoothen initial data, but only for a, a short time interval. So because this is a non-homogeneous, as a forcing term, you need, you really need some control over like the, the global. If, if the, it would it, be great if this term was zero, then, then yeah, it does. I think the key here is we have to always prove that the forcing term is small enough so that the omega doesn't blow up. 